Help me, rotate. I'm pushing up, I'm pushing rotate. up. Rotate, rotate. No, they're rotating back, they're rotating back, they're rotating back. They're gonna go, just rotate guys, just rotate, give it up, just give it up. Right. Nice, up. rotate, up. rotate, rotate. Oh, yeah. Greetings and welcome to lucky episode number 13 of the rotation with Z-Hack, myself as per usual, and my right hand man Murph, you can see him on the screen right there. We're ready to bring all things Call of Duty League related to you today for entertainment purposes. Thanks so much everyone for tuning in as always on YouTube, Spotify, and Apple Podcasts. It's The Rotation with Z-Hack, or you can find me on Twitter at ZHack16. Let me know what you want us to talk about and cover here on The Rotation, and we'll do it. Guys, I am wired today, and I'm ready to talk Call of Duty League. If you don't believe me, look at this. That's my afternoon cup of joe. And I'm taking it straight. The CDL matches just happened for the day, and I am absolutely loving where the Call of Duty League is. So we got to hop right into some first blood, and I want to share a story with you guys today about the Call of Duty League and community in general. I love how deep the Call of Duty community can run. I know sometimes I complain about it being so toxic, but this story that I'm about to share with you is one of the brighter spots, in my opinion, from what I've experienced within the Call of Duty scene. So as you guys know, and for those of you who don't know, my day job, my normal, you know, guy, my, not even nine to five because the hours are crazy. I work weekends, holidays, four in the morning, whatever. I'm an assistant golf professional at a golf course here in Arizona, and I, I'm checking in some guests yesterday, and this guy walks through the golf shop door. I say, hey, man, what's going on? And he has a 100 Thieves hat on. So I tell him, I say, yo, that's a sick hat, man. I love it. I, you, you a gamer or what? And he goes, yeah, yeah, I'm just visiting right now. We came out to Arizona for a bachelor party, and we just started hitting it off. We were talking about the 100 Thieves organization as a whole, Nade Shot, Courage, Valkyrie, all those people. And I asked him, I was like, oh, do you, you like Call of Duty or you, what's your thing? And he goes, you know, I really, I really like the Valorant team, but I also pay attention to all the other teams. I've paid attention to League of Legends in the past. I pay attention to Valorant. And yeah, I pay attention to the Call of Duty team. And then, of course, with what the LA Thieves just did, picking up Huke and getting him out of his contract with the Dallas Empire, we had to talk about that. So we talked in the golf shop for a good like 10, 15 minutes just about gaming and the Call of Duty League and our opinion, which I'm going to get to in a little bit later here in the rotation with Z-Hack, about the roster move to pick up Huke and bench TJ. And I just thought back on it after he exited the golf shop. I was just like, damn. The gaming community is a cool place, and that was a sick-ass dude. I just talked to him for 10 minutes. I don't even know him, never met him in my life, but the thing that brought us together, our common shared experience, was video games and being a part of this awesome community. So if anyone can find this guy, tell him I said what's up at Papago Golf Club. That's where I work. That's where he came to play, and it was just cool to get to connect with someone on the basis of video games and the Call of Duty League and to share our experience. And I talked to him about it and he was like, oh yeah, that's that. I, I agree with what you think about the roster move. And I was like, yeah, I know I try my best. This is my day job, but I also do a little podcast called The Rotation with Z-Hack because I had to plug it. And he was like, oh, no way, really? And then he went to check it out. So it's just feeling that kind of support and that kind of camaraderie from person to person with a stranger I've never met. It's one of the coolest things ever. And that's why I love the Call of Duty League. And I love the COD community and I will forever dedicate and devote my passion and time to this scene. That's just a quick story I wanted to share with you guys about First Blood. So always remember, when you're playing a game with a random, when you see someone in person wearing a gaming shirt or apparel or an organization, whatever it may be, strike up a conversation with them. Because they could be a cool person and you could ultimately become friends with them, game with them down the road, go to a LAN event. Hint, hint, here we come, Call of Duty League, or whatever it may be. So that's the first blood, and now we got to get into the nitty-gritty, the dirty topics that have come upon us the past couple of weeks in the Call of Duty League. So let's hit it. The barracks, news and notes from around the league. There has been a lot that has happened and there have been so many storylines from roster changes to players to teams winning, teams losing, and most importantly, where and what we'll be competing on 
in the near future. I know a while back we had it teased that land would be coming back, but it wasn't really with any details, and I have to toot my own horn here, pat my own back, and give myself all the credit because I'm basically a psychic, mind reader, whatever it may be, or I'm just an incredible Call of Duty analyst. Plain and simple. I talked about it when LAN was initially teased through the Call of Duty League and what I knew that they would do at the top of the organization. I thought, I don't think this is going to be as easy as possible and fans don't think it's going to be what they want it to be, in a sense. I said, with the Call of Duty League announcing that they're coming back to LAN, 99% sure that there will not be fans, and that was my opinion and what I said, and that has come true, and we have to take a look at all the details now because finally the Call of Duty League has hit us with an official statement when it comes to what we have with LAN, so without further ado, let's check it out here. You take a peek at everything that happened, and we'll run through the headlines, and I'll give you my take on it, and what I've already predicted, I told you, we'll run through all that as well. So the Call of Duty League goes back to land. You guys know I went to NAU, Northern Arizona University, for broadcast journalism, so I'll tell you what, I can read a script, and that's what we're going to do here. Today, we are proud to announce Call of Duty League Major 4 will be played in a live event setting hosted by the 2020 Call of Duty League champions, Dallas Empire. Following the Stage 4 online regular season, Call of Duty League will venture to Esports Stadium Arlington for the first LAN event of the year, Major 4, taking place June 17 to the 20th of 2021. I could not have been more hype to hear this because I don't think you all understand what this means from a competitive level. Like what we're doing right now, we're competing. We're at great heights. We have the best of the best against one another, but we're online. Guys, let me tell you something. For some of you who have not experienced local play on LAN, whether it be in a tournament setting, I'm going to tell you what to do right now. Go find your friend. Go find your roommate. Whoever you need to, have them pull out their setup, have you pull out your setup, connect them together, and just play a 1v1 on LAN, in your house, in your apartment, whatever it may be, wherever it is, day or night, I don't care. Just do it. And then after that, do the same thing, connected with them or someone else online, and tell me you can't feel the difference. Tell me the response times aren't different. Tell me your shot does not feel a little bit different from LAN to online, and just the smoothness and the way that the engine and the game provides feel to you through the sticks. You literally feel the LAN, the difference, coursing through your scuff impact when you're playing. Shout out to Scuff Gaming. You guys know I'm still looking for a sponsor of the rotation with Z-Hack. The phone line's open. I might as well come to you. But you guys can literally feel the difference when we are on LAN. So this is a major change-up in the Call of Duty League. We all have been begging and pleading for it and needing it to happen. And it's finally been announced when we're going to get it June 17th through the 20th of this year for the Stage 4 Major. We're running out of time there because that leaves Stage 4, Stage 5, and Champs is what we get for LAN. But we have to soak that in and take it. So what I take from this in my next prediction is that this is the major, which we'll talk about the format for that in a second as well. We got to take it one topic at a time because like I said, so much has happened. So we play this stage four major, but then what happens for the stage five regular season weeks? I think personally, and I've said it time and time again, we see something like what we think what we saw for the playoffs in previous years where teams would go to Columbus play at the MLG headquarters where Adam Apicella and his boys and girls and incredible crew had everything lined up for a LAN event. There were no fans there. They were just playing LAN matches. They would go through a gauntlet on the weekend, get their seating for the playoffs. So I think we may see something like that in Texas because that's basically the bubble that we formed where the regular season will commence. I think it's a smart idea, and I think it's a feasible idea to have all the teams 
come to a land venue, whether it be eSports Stadium, Arlington, if we rent it out for the regular season four weeks and play our regular season matches there. And then the major, if it's in the same spot somewhere else, I don't really care as long as it's all on land. I think if we get teams competing on land for the regular season and the major from here on out, that's the most important thing. Because what are you going to do? You're going to have the stage four major on land, and then you're going to play the stage five regular season back online? That doesn't make any sense to me. So I think what has to happen is once you hit land, you're stuck with it. That's where you are. So we get the stage four major on land, and then we do something like we saw with the playoffs to get seeding back in the day where teams play their regular season matches on land as well, and then the major is on land, and hopefully, my goodness, I hope that we can get fans by the time that champs come around. I don't know if it's a reasonable expectation to think that we'll get like a home series or the stage five regular season or even the stage five major with attendance. Because as we read through this some more and more, as a part of our initial return to live events, Major 4 will adhere to strict league health and safety protocols and attendance will be limited, and this is the point you got to highlight, to players in the league as well as limited Call of Duty League and team staff. So that means that probably owners like Hex, Hastro, and those guys, coaches like Revan, Ricky, all those guys, the players... And then the production crew of the Call of Duty League and Johanna Ferries, if she wants to come, and everybody else. That is what will be allowed for attendance. Those will be the minimum tickets. They're not even going to be tickets, but the minimum that they will allow will be players, coaches, owners, and most likely the production crew. So that way they can bring it to us over the airwaves of YouTube. Thank you, Call of Duty League, for the work that you do and the production value that you maintain and how incredible the Call of Duty League is for what you do. Sincerely, thank you. But that is what will be there, and they say attendees will follow strict COVID-19 protocols, including rapid response testing throughout the event. So I don't know if that's going to be once a day, once you get there through the weekend, like a negative test is good, or how they're going to implement these tests, but they are being diligent. So they're going to adhere to those protocols and they're exploring ways, as they say here, for the CDL to return to a live event format as long as it's safe to do so. This is the first step in the process. Stay tuned for more details. So I'm extremely excited for this because I know that the players have wanted to be on LAN. A lot of them don't think they're getting their fair shot by being online because there's extraneous circumstances that can cost them games. There's times you get joked, plain and simple. Yes, it happens. Online COD, you're going to get joked. But at the end of the day, you can still control the outcome for the most part, in my opinion. But these guys who are comfortable on LAN, they will continue to stay comfortable on LAN, and I think that will shine through. So that's the first thing that we have to talk about when it comes to what the recent announcement is from the Call of Duty League. I'm as excited as ever to have land back, and I think everybody else should be too. So there's things that come with the territory. Like I said, no fans for a little while. I would love to see fans eventually, maybe the Stage 5 major, maybe Stage 5 regular season, at least champs. Because I want to be there front and center, creating content, doing the podcast live and in person. I think it's a cool experience and it's a cool idea to have. And I think I could make it happen. So I personally would love to see that. And going back to players wanting this so bad, I'm going to break it down to you right now. When we get back to being on land, there will be players who shine and there will be players who falter. Some guys are just land guys. You've seen it from year to year, time and time again, since like Black Ops 3. There can be guys who are absolutely having online. And then when the pressure is on, when the lights are on, when you're on main stage, they falter. They can't handle the pressure on land. Plain and simple, it, it'll happen time and time again. And we can see it now. The Call of Duty League is being overrun by rookies and incredible performances right now, a lot of which who have not had the opportunity to compete on land. 
Once you get that first kill, take that first shot, of course, those jitters are going to be out. But then it comes down to the mechanics, the difference, the feel, and everything that happens on land. And then also, when you have Clayster on the other side of the stage, oh my god! That can get in your head because you can feel a little embarrassed. Like, if you get turned on in a round 11 S&D, and Clay is doing that, and the fans are getting hype as well, you could feel a rush of embarrassment where your face gets red, and you're like, oh my god. I just got smoked on main stage. There are all these people in the arena watching this, let alone the hundreds of thousands who are viewing it on YouTube. And that pressure can get to you. So I know a lot of guys are happy to get back to land. Some guys will say they are, and some may even be hesitant, but they won't share that with you because they'll think, I'm a professional. I'm one of the best players in the world. I'm going to be able to do it. But I guarantee right now, there will be players who underperform on land that you think are better. And there will be players who skyrocket and come out of the woodwork and impress you. So those are some things to take into consideration when we get to land. I think that the safety protocol is important, that we are sure that we are maintaining strong safety protocols. And other than that, I mean, I'm excited for it. I predicted that this would be the situation with no fans, but this is going to mean a lot. The one thing it does shake up, though, and heady play by the Call of Duty League, the predictions, man. Pick'em is going to be crazy because teams as a whole, I just mentioned individuals being different on land. Teams as a whole are going to perform different on land. I know you guys are all going to be just harassing people in the comments on this video right now saying, oh, Florida onliners this, Florida onliners that, phase onliners this, phase onliners that, Minnesota this, Minnesota that. Settle down. But... While you're calling those people out, it might be fair because there are teams who will excel from that environment and from that experience. So I think it really messes with Pick'em because from picking those particular players to putting them on a team and seeing how they've performed in the past, it'll be interesting. You break down like the Minnesota Rocker, for example, Accuracy and Attach have been guys who have been on land before and performed heavy. Priest as well. But then you see someone like Standy who's never done it before on this level in the Call of Duty League when the lights are on. I'm not saying he won't be good on LAN, but that's a situation where it's almost like a 2-2-3-1 split on the team and you don't know what's going to happen. So there can be a lot that stems from being back on LAN. All I have to say is I'm excited for it. Predictions are going to be hard and you better buckle in because the rest of the season is going to be incredible. Guys! We have been blessed with an, an awesome, competitive, and just stellar storylines being formed week in and week out throughout the Call of Duty League. We have been fortunate to have the competitions that we have, and also the way that the Call of Duty League has come through, battled adversity, and put on the show they have, and all these players being good sports and having good attitudes, competing every single day, and staying strong, because I know how hard it is to do it in your bedroom. It's been great. The league has been at its peak almost this year. Like, it's been a lot of fun for me to watch, and I think it's been beneficial to have it throughout these times of COVID because being at home, not being able to go do stuff, you need a source of entertainment. You can only watch so much Netflix and YouTube videos and all this. So the Call of Duty League has been an outlet for many, and we've looked forward to Thursday through Sunday every single week because we've gotten entertained by these map five round 11s, by these crazy hard point comebacks, by the upsets, these personalities we can root for and cheer for and the rivalries we formed within our fan bases. The Call of Duty League has been great for mental health and great for entertainment for those of us who have struggled throughout the pandemic and seeing it get back to its peak, 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 the Mount Everest of competitive integrity on land, it's gonna be awesome. So that is the first thing that was announced with the Call of Duty League. And now I'm going to bring it back on the screen and we can break down and dive into the second thing that was announced in this same, you know, sort of news article or press release, if you will, from the Call of Duty League. They are listening to me because I said this on the podcast last week. We need to change the format a little bit. Thank goodness. The Call of Duty League format, and this is a start, it's a small step in my opinion, but it moves to a four-day schedule for Major 3. That's awesome. So listen to this. Beginning next week, 
for major number three, the Call of Duty League will also be moving to a four-day schedule. Instead of starting on Wednesday, major three will start on a Thursday, which is May 13th, a day after my birthday. Hello, let's go, baby. Guys, I'm going to be a quarter century old. It's the big 2-5 for me. I know Clay's birthday was just this past week. Show me some love in the comments on Twitter. Happy birthday, Z-Hack or something. May 12th is my birthday. I'll be turning 25. Anyways, the competition for Major 3 will start that Thursday, May 13th. This new tournament schedule will feature four matches on Thursday and Friday, five on Saturday, and then three on Championship Sunday, including the best of nine, and each day will end with a winner's bracket match. Look at Murph back there. He's hype. This is what I've been begging for. Because look at today. I'm recording this on Friday the 7th. We saw the Florida Mutineers upset the Empire 3-0 and phase smoke Seattle 3-1. The day was done in a blink of an eye. I've been complaining about it. I know we're doing our best to put on a, a, a great show, and we do. Like all this stuff with the analyst desk, the stories, the commentary, everything is incredible, but give me more matches. That's what we've been begging for since the beginning of the year, and it looks like we're finally going to get it in the Stage 3 Major. I can't watch two matches a day for much longer. It's hard to do because I get hype, I sit down, and then it's over, just like that. So this is incredible to see that we get four matches on Thursday, four on Friday, five on Saturday. How good of a weekend is that? And then three on Sunday, including the championship match. We love championship Sunday around here. And then we get the winner's bracket match each day. This is incredible because not only it gives so much content for the fans to just inject in their veins and be absolutely focused on throughout the day, throughout the weekend. It stimulates us the way we need to be stimulated by the Call of Duty League matches. And also it gives the players more entertainment because this can also mean, I know for the first couple of days, maybe not, but this can also mean teams are playing more than one match in a day before Sunday, which is what we need. We've talked about this in the past. Players have talked about this in the past. When you just play one match in a day, it's difficult to get hot. So when there's going to be four matches on Thursday, Friday, and five on Saturday, teams will be playing multiple matches. This gives them a chance to get hot in their first match and go straight into a second match. And that's when you're going to see the clash of Titans head-to-head -head against one another, the best of the best, warmed up, frying, animated, and absolutely inspired. This is what we needed, and cheers to the Call of Duty League. My Turtle Beaches, off to you, even though you guys are sponsored by Astro. Oh, gosh, I've done that so many times. I'm sorry. I need Astros. If you want me to be a Call of Duty League podcast and pull all the sponsors, I have my scuff here already. I have my gamer grip here already. I need some Astros, plain and simple. But thank you for listening to us as the fans and us as a community, because we have been asking to stop giving us two matches a day on Thursday and Friday, or Wednesday, Thursday, in the major time. So thank you for listening. Guys, this is incredible. We're getting four matches Thursday, Friday, five on Saturday, and then three, including the championship, best of nine on Sunday. We've asked for this. Everybody go tweet Call of Duty League right now and just say thank you from Z-Hack. Thank you for giving us an incredible schedule for the major. And I hope this continues in the regular season throughout the rest of the season. Minimum three matches a day. That's it. End of story. Maybe it'll be easier when we get expansion with 16 teams. But for now, like we need to try three matches a day minimum. If we have to move it to just Friday, Saturday, Sunday for the regular season and hit us with three matches a day or four matches a day. But two, it, it's hard. So they've listened, and this is what we're looking forward to for the Stage 3 Major and hopefully on. So we get land back, and we get a change in format. We're on the rise. Joanna, you are doing incredible things. I'd love to have you on the podcast and chat sometime. But this is awesome to see. League operations are listening to the fans, and they know what will make us happy, and they know how to improve viewership and make the league better, and they're doing it. They're not sitting around and just brainstorming and going, nah. They are doing it, they're making changes, they're making adjustments, and I love it. You guys know who else is making changes? 
Transition. Hello. The LA Thieves are making monumental changes. Oh my goodness. If you guys have been living under a rock, then you haven't seen it. But I'll break the news to you. But it shouldn't be breaking news at all. Huke to the LA Thieves. They bench TJ. Bye-bye Dallas Empire for Huke. This just reiterates my point that this could not be a talent issue from Huke. There is no way that the Empire bench him for Fellow. Fellow's a good player, and he's still performing well. I'm not knocking the guy. But Huke is a generational talent, for goodness sake. There is no way that he got benched for his performance. There had to be something chemistry-wise, something he wasn't doing, something behind the scenes to put Huke on the bench for the Dallas Empire. Something with him in management. I don't know what the hell happened with Huke. But, oh my gosh, heady play by Nadeshot and the LA Thieves to pick him up. It's an incredible move, in my opinion. And I, I can already hear all you guys, all you haters on the other side. Oh, wah, wah. what are the LA Thieves doing? They're so stupid. You just beat Optic 3-1. The team is on the rise with Kenny, Venom, TJ, Andraza. What are you doing? How could you break up that roster? I hear you guys saying that in my head already. And I'm going to break it down for you. This is an incredible move by whoever it was. Mud Dog, J-Cap, Nade Shot. Everyone combined, this is the best move that LA Thieves have made in their history, hands down. I don't care how well they were playing. I don't care that they beat Optic 3-1 and they were on the rise. Huke is a generational, once-in-a-lifetime talent, and you do not pass up when you have the opportunity to get him on your team. This is like LeBron James in his prime going into free agency. You don't worry about hurting your starter's feelings because you're here to win championships. You say, mm, <laughs> well, LeBron is uh, he's on the waiver wire, so we're going to go pick him up. Sorry, you're going to be a sixth man now, and he's going to be the starter because we're trying to win a championship. Huke is a top three, maybe top two submachine gun player of all time. Not just in Cold War, of all time. He's a multiple FPS champion. Halo, Call of Duty, he's a stud. His mind for the game is stellar. His talent is off the charts. And I've heard nothing but him being an incredible teammate. So when you have the opportunity to go get that... To go get some who will sacrifice everything for the team to win a championship, you do not pass up on it. The goal for the LA Thieves is to win championships and Huke will make a difference. Yeah, I get it. A couple hundred thousand dollars for every major, but Champs is a multi-million dollar tournament. And it's the peak of Call of Duty. Very few players have won Champs and a lot have not even won a tournament in their history of playing, let alone be etched in that trophy and in history forever as a champion. Hook has already done it once with the Dallas Empire, and he's trying to go back to back. He's done it before. He can do it again. The goal is to win that multi-million dollar tournament at the end of the year. The LA Thieves are nasty. If we're doing power rankings, they could be one, two, or three with these guys, in my opinion, depending on how they mesh together right out of the gates. We'll see their first match tomorrow. And I'm looking forward to it. Listen to this. I've said it time and time again about the LA Thieves. You build your roster around Kenny. He is an incredible boots-on-the-ground player. You do that. You get pieces who can form around him. But now you have two superstars. Kenny... Huke, Draza has been incredible, incredible in his young career. Back in Modern Warfare, in Challengers, in the league, and so far from what he's done in Cold War, he's been incredible. And it looks like Venom is finally just hitting his stride. This team is disgusting and one I'm worried about. Huke is a top submachine gun player of all time. He'll go down in history in the Call of Duty League. This is an absolutely stellar move by the LA Thieves, and you cannot convince me otherwise. I won't listen to you if you try. You cannot make an argument to tell me that this is a bad move. 
you got to rip the Band-Aid. You got to hurt TJ's feelings for a little bit. Because at the end of the day, it's a cutthroat league. You want to win championships? The best of the best is available. You go and get them. Plain and simple, I love the move from the LA Thieves. That is crazy. We've talked so much about roster changes this year. That is maybe one of the craziest ones of all time. The Empire are getting plenty of flack. Everyone's like, what the hell was Hastro thinking? I think there's a lot more riding into this. And maybe five years down the road, we'll actually get a reason why Huke was benched and why he was let go of by the Dallas Empire. Speaking of all these other roster changes we've talked about through the Call of Duty League this season, everybody needs to take a step back because a lot of you guys are like me who follow the Call of Duty League. I'm 25. I've been following competitive Call of Duty since like Ghosts, Black Ops 2, when Haggy was the GOAT on Fariko Impact. Like I've been around this place for a long time. And you guys need to do the same thing I'm doing in this point I'm making. Take a step back. Take off the blinders and look at this. The rookies are taking over the Call of Duty League and it's happening right before our eyes. We are slowly seeing old veterans and players who have been around forever going out and being traded with these stud rookies, with these guys like Standy, with these guys like Insight and now Hydra. And this isn't just a one-year thing. I can promise you that. These young players are taking over the Call of Duty League and they will be the staple names for years to come. Soak it in while you can because nothing lasts forever. Appreciate what we have right now. Appreciate Clayster still performing at his peak. Appreciate T2P still in the league. We lost Zuma this year. Methods. Slasher. Pay attention, guys. Look at this. These new up-and-comers, Simp, Abizi, Hydra, Insight, Standy, they're the new fresh names to come. All we need for everyone to be happy with them taking over the league is for them to get involved in the content side. That's why so many of us fell in love with Skump and Nadeshot is because the content they produced, we felt like we knew them person to person and we were friends with them and we got their personalities from the YouTube videos and then we got to watch them play in Championship Sunday and that is who we rooted for. These young guys, they're taking over the competitive scene. All we need is a reason to fall in love with them. Once they start hitting YouTube, once they start doing the funny videos with each other that the organizations have them do on the off days, if they can follow the brand of Optic and have content days and do that, these young guys will be the names engraved in our minds as Call of Duty League greats forever. It's bittersweet. It's fun to watch. It's exciting to see. But I just want to have you guys slow down for a second and understand that nothing lasts forever. It's fun to watch these new guys. I love it. I'm excited to see what they can do as the years go on. But just my two cents as we were talking about roster changes. This coffee is incredible. You guys might think I'm crazy. I had to be up at 3.30 in the morning to get to work today. So I need this afternoon cup of joe. Blonde, Starbucks, just straight black, iced because it's 100 degrees in Arizona. Delicious. I'm wired. All right, it's time to get into it. We got to browse over what's going on in stage three right now as we head through the final week into the major and talk playoff implications and seeding. Let's start right now looking at what happened today, and there was some craziness and insanity that ensued. As you can take a peek at my predictions, I'm, I'm pretty damn good throughout this stage. 47 points right now, 21-19, and then, God, I'm not going to lie. I didn't have Florida winning this match. I thought that the presence of Shotzi and Illy with the heroic plays and leadership of Crim Six was going to be enough today because Florida are so streaky. I'm going to take a timeout because I've said this before and they're starting to piss me off when it comes to prediction. I love Florida. I love Skies. I love Big Wake. I love the Greasy Gang and Havoc. And I love one of those other rookies, Neptune. 
But they have been so inconsistent. They win one, they lose one. They get smoked by Paris, and then they come out and beat the Empire. Give me some consistency, guys, because I love rooting for Florida. I want to be able to do it, but they're just not consistent enough. And I'm honestly just sad that I'm not perfect and pick them on the weekend. But you see me on the previous days. Minnesota, I had that one, and I had NYSL. I thought it was going to be a little bit tighter. But guys, like there are some crazy storylines unfolding as we head down the home stretch of stage three into the major and the seeding. It's crazy. You all know what happens here. The top teams get the winner's bracket. Then the best of the best get the buy from each pool. Everyone else down to the loser's bracket. So right here, NYSL, they're one, of my, they're one of my favorites. They're one of the best teams in the league. Hydra has just added nothing but value to them as a roster. The Rocker are getting it together. LAG, I like what they have going on with Chino. I think they're a couple of steps away from getting everything clicked in. This was a fun match to watch today. FaZe versus Surge, oh my god. The brother versus brother, 1v1. The twins on checkmate in the plane. Pristini gets fried by Arsides. Those are the storylines we live for. Those are the things, like if that happened in Champs, it was a 1v1 on main stage. I guarantee you, I'm getting goosebumps thinking about this. I guarantee you if that situation happened in like a round 11 checkmate SND and Arsides guns Pristini to win the round, to win Champs, he would be crying, and that would be one of the videos where he would dart across the stage to hug his brother before he would celebrate with his teammates. And that would be a cool experience. I literally have goosebumps. Uh, you, you can't. Oh, uh, yeah, you can kind of see it, but I literally have goosebumps. That would be so cool. So this was a fun one to watch. I like the roster change by the Seattle Surge. Desi, he looks good so far. He looked huge on the Apocalypse hard point, and I think he has more to show. Murphy definitely agrees. He's a little bit hungry, I think, but he wants to weigh in on the roster changes too. What do you think, buddy? What do you think about the Seattle Surge roster changes? Okay. Yep. I agree. Yeah, absolutely. You want me to tell him? You want me to tell everyone listening to the rotation with z All right. So Murph says, he says the Seattle Surge needed to make a change. But there was no way they were beating the Atlanta phase. They need a little bit more time to get in tune with one another. But there was no way that they were beating the Atlanta phase today. The Atlanta phase are too good. They're one of the top teams in the league, in Murphy's opinion. But he really wanted to touch on what happened with Florida and Dallas today. He said, Havoc, the route man gets paid. He's had a couple of matches to get loosened up with these guys. And now he's finally fitting into his role. We know that Skies and Big Wake are the slayers of the team. Neptune and Havoc, you guys run the routes. You guys hit the OBJ. We're going to kill everyone. Florida are dangerous when that game plan is working in full effect. They looked incredible today. I love rooting for these guys. There's something about them. I love the branding of their team. First of all, their logo is sick. Their colors are sick. I need some merch. I got to go buy some Florida Mutineers merch. I need a Z-Hack jersey. I'm going to go do it. I'm doing it. But the recipe for success for Florida, it shined through today. Let Big Wake and Skies absolutely dominate everyone on the map. I think Skies had a 1.52 in the series as they take down the Empire. Havoc ran the routes. Havoc came up big in SND. He made some huge plays. That's his thing. I've been watching the kid play wagers for years in Search and Destroy. He's got a big brain. And then Neptune, the rookie, he's incredible. I'm going to say it. I love the Florida Mutineers. The rotation with Z-Hack roots for the Florida Mutineers. I love those guys. I love NYSL. I've said it time and time again. That was a huge match for Florida today. I got to go get some merch. I think big things for them to come in the Stage 3 Major. Let's break this down quickly before we get into the standings. Toronto Ultra, they're the best in the game right now, plain and simple. They're coming off the Stage 2 Major Championship. They're incredible. They look great. I think they smoke Paris tomorrow. And then this is the debut. This is one that we get to see. This is Huke's first match with LA. And who is it against? It's against Clayster, one of his old teammates. But it's also against the New York Subliners, who I think are one of the best teams in the league. Right now, both these teams have been looking really, really efficient. 
I think I may change this prediction. I don't really know what I'm going to do. I think maybe just because the honeymoon period and the time that Huke needs to adapt with this roster, it might be Florida. I think I can guarantee I would I would bet that this one is going to be a 3-2 because these two teams are among the top four in the Call of Duty League, in my opinion. They're powerhouses, and we're going to see it all unfold tomorrow. Oh, I'm excited. Then you get Florida again against LAG. I think Florida win it again. The recipe is here. I think they'll be challenged a little bit more in Search and Destroy because that's where I think LAG shine. I think Chino, Silly, they combine for some good brains in the S&D. Ultimately, though, I think, I don't know, I just think Florida do it. Florida looked really good in response today. They didn't need to hit two hard points. They did it. They smoked Dallas on the control. Like, that checkmate control was incredible. So I think Florida get it done. Sunday? Sunday, Sunday, Sunday. You got some more close ones. That one can go either way. I think Seattle could beat London in that series. But I think London have also looked really good lately. Man, that's a dangerous prediction. After this, I think Optic are going to struggle heading into the Stage 3 Major. They have shown struggles. They lost to New York. I think they lose to FaZe again. I think they just have a couple of things to figure out before they get back into everything. But I know that these boys come to shine in crunch time. Like, on the way to championships and in championships, that's when Optic come to shine. So don't be surprised if they just come out of nowhere and smoke phase, and then they find themselves in the winner's bracket. Finally, Empire versus Rocker. Empire, they just don't have it right now, plain and simple. They don't. The roster change, the fans having backlash on them, the performance hasn't been there. They're still figuring things out. I think Minnesota beat them. That's how I think everything unfolds, and let's see where that takes us in the bracket. So very interesting what happened in Group A today. Because Toronto Ultra, they're getting the one seed, no matter what, in my opinion. Because they have four wins, I don't think anyone else gets there, really. Because even if they lose this match, even if Toronto lose to Paris, it's not going to matter because they're four and one. They'll be the one seed, 100%. Toronto are the best out of Group A. They're going to have the automatic buy. But then, two, three, and four up for grabs. So we break this down. Looking at the matches that will be played. Right now, we'll look at the Dallas Empire first. They're 2-2. Two and two. I have them going to 2-3. Two and three. They lose to the Minnesota Rocker. With that being said, the Minnesota Rocker go to 3-2. and two. Then what happens? The Florida Mutineers, with them beating LAG, they also go to 3-2. and two. Ah, It's nuts. It's crazy. So then we have Minnesota and Florida tied. And what are the tiebreakers? Head-to-head match win percentage, head-to-head game win percentage overall. And it's in the event that they tie in the group standings or the regular season standings, tie will be broken, head-to-head win percentage. So I don't know if this is taking just in this stage or over the entire year because if it's just in the stage for this, we can look back here all the way at the London Home Series And look at that. Florida would own the tiebreaker. They would have the two. And Minnesota would have the three seed. So ultimately, I think that's how things shake out. Based on my predictions, Toronto one, Florida two, Rocker three. Then this is where things get dicey because there's going to be more tiebreaks between LAG. Actually, I think I have them going to one and four. I have both LAG and Paris going to one and four, so then Dallas will be solo in fourth. Yeah, that's how I have it shaken out. So that's my predictions of the Group A standings. It'll be Toronto, Florida, Minnesota, Dallas, then the tiebreak between Paris and LAG, which survey says... When did they play? Paris and Gorillas. Yeah, yeah. So Gorillas would take that. So that's where the seeding would be, and that would be just battling for where they are in the loser's bracket. So it's nutty. Saturday, Sunday are crazy storylines for what's going to happen and who gets the buys. Because as we know, we'll look at the bracket real quick. I know I'm driving you guys crazy going back and forth. 
right here. Group A, first place, so Toronto. Then group B, first place, whoever I tell you. Second and third, second and third. Okay, so top three, get the winner's round so they have the opportunity to lose, make a loser's bracket run. And then you get the four seed right here, then the five, six, five, six. So that's how it shakes down in the major if you guys haven't been paying attention as the year's gone along so far. And then look at this wild, wild storyline in group B. Three-way tie for first. Holy cow. Right now I have subliners beating LAG, so they'll go to four and one. Three and two. Sorry, LA Thieves, not LAG. And then you have to look at what the Atlanta Phase do. Phase play optic. That could be huge. Because, like, that's a must win if they want to be first. And then that would put optic in a tie as well. I can't even predict this one. I don't even know what's happening. I think outright, it's, it's going to be, holy cow. So it's either going to be LA Thieves in first, Subliners in first, Phase in first, and there's a tie break for first no matter what happens. And if not, Optic will be tied for second, and then there's going to be a tie break there. Then these two guys will be at the bottom of the leaderboard. The surge may go over in the group. And that's how things shake down as we look at the group stage standings. So if you guys haven't been, please tune into Saturday and Sunday for the Call of Duty League because it is going to be nuts. It's going to be absolutely crazy. I can't wait for it. I'm excited for it. Those are how the groups are going to shake out. And those are the storylines that you have to break down. It's going to be fun to watch. Root for who you want to root for. Have fun and enjoy everything that happens. Do you guys you guys want to do a segment we haven't seen in a while? I think you might. We might have, have one topic for this guy here. And I already broke it down. So let's get into it. Just one bullet point. It's going to be a quick hitter. It's overkill reactions around the Call of Duty League. Overkill reactions around the Call of Duty League. So what I've heard... With the recent leaks that I talked about at the beginning of the podcast, I have heard people say, LAN won't mean much. Overkill! LAN means a hell of a lot. Because like I mentioned, there will be players who are at their peak right now who will get nervous and underperform on LAN. Then there will be guys who are used to LAN and are maybe having a mediocre season, and they will absolutely fry when they get on LAN instead of online. Also, team chemistry, team comp, the way you play the things that happen on land and the way that things go from map to map, series to series, it's a lot different and it matters. For anyone who has been at a live Call of Duty League event, competed at one, whatever it may be, you know what I'm talking about. So that is overkill when you tell me that land won't mean much because it's going to change a lot and I'm excited to see how much of an impact it makes in stage four and stage five. That's the one overkill reaction I have right there. And now we have one more segment to end us today. Everybody knows what's coming. You know what we rock and roll with, what we end the podcast with every single week. Who's the best in the game? Who's the best in the game? It's one of those rookies that I was talking about who will take over the Call of Duty League for years to come. There were so many question marks around him when he joined the league. We didn't know if he was worth a starting slot on a team. And then he came and shut everyone up real quick. The guy is an animal. It's even in his at on Twitter. It is Hydra from the New York Subliners. The kid is an absolute beast and he is built different. I tweeted it the other day when I was watching the NYSL series against Optic. I said, oh my God, this guy Hydra is different. And he absolutely is. When you look at the stat line, he took over the series with a 1.58 KD. He dropped 93 on Optic and was the sole proprietor of their demise. He was the reason that NYSL 3-1 Optic Chicago. He went 93 and 59 and dealt 15K damage leading the entire lobby. Hydra is a beast. Hydra is the truth. 
There were so many question marks around him. Oh, he's competing in Europe. Challengers competition isn't as stiff. He's not worth the starting spot. NYSL are performing well enough. Woo! Did he prove all the haters wrong? The kid's disgusting. First map, Apocalypse on hardpoint. Yeah, smooth 29 and 14. I'm going to drop a 2.07. What? Does he make a difference in SND? Yeah, I think the kid does. 2.25 with a 9 and 4 map record and 1,500 damage. Wow. The kid's a beast. Then you break down, you look at control, they get 3-1, and that's one of Optic's best maps. Checkmate control. He still had a 1.4 and was not the reason that NYSL lost that map. What do you see next? The hard point. When's the last time you saw Optic lose both hard points in a series? Well, I'll tell you. It was against NYSL this past week. He goes 27 and 21 in the Moscow hard point to close out the series. Don't be surprised if one, NYSL win the stage three major, and two, if Hydra is the MVP and the reason why. I'll put my name on it right now. Stamp it, sign, sealed, and delivered from Z Hack. Hydra is an absolute beast. He is the best in the game right now. I love the kid. I love his energy. I love what he does. I love how he works with Clay. And he's a beast on the map. He's a menace. And I'm excited to watch him as we progress in the league. That's going to do it for this episode of The Rotation with Z-Hack. We've done a baker's dozen. Lucky number 13, baby. Thanks so much, everyone, for tuning in with The Rotation with Z-Hack, as I do say so myself. Make sure you leave a comment, like, subscribe, all that good stuff on YouTube. Zach Warhack, Z-A-C-H-W-O-R-H-A-C-K, or Z-Hack 16, or just look up the rotation with Z-Hack. That's what it is on Spotify and Apple Podcasts. Then find me on Twitter at Z-Hack 16, Z-H-A-C-K 16. Thanks again, everyone, for tuning in to episode number 13 of the rotation with Z-Hack. We'll see you for the stage three major. Peace.